Hello everyone, welcome back. It's Space Engineers Plus Me, episode 57. I'm Enigmius, and today we're looking at the prototype of the Atlas Gondola Mark III. That's right, Mark III. <laughs> it's never been in service and we're already up to Mark III. This is going to be the ship that carries the drills, that dangles from the Atlas, that moves back and forth and mines stuff and sends it up to the Atlas for storage. Very important ship, and it's taken us three iterations to get to this point, just because there's so many different moving uh, parts to it. Now, this episode is basically going to give you an overview of what's going on with this ship. The next episode will show you this ship in, ac in action alongside the Mark II version of the track ship, the Mark I version being that guy right there. The idea is to kind of break it up a little bit because it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff going on in a couple of medium-sized ships that's a little bit overwhelming if we try and tackle it all at once. And it took a very long time to get to this point, so that's really all I have to show you is what we've got so far. Now, we're going to get a little bit of air here. so we can. It's basically a kind of squashed cylinder, um, and it's designed actually to be fairly light. I didn't want it to be this big lumbering thing because that just means we need more thrust to make things happen. It's supposed to be suspended and letting something else carry the load, but we still have to be able to maneuver this ship up onto the track ship in order to get everything started. So that was kind of a key consideration we had, and that's why we kept the outer hull pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and tried to look at what we had done in the previous iterations and see what we could remove without hurting the functionality of the ship. Now, one of the things you might notice already is with these sections here, these uh, blast door uh, pieces, this used to be one great big beam that ran continuously across the top of the ship and I realized it wasn't necessary. We've got basically three uh, shorter tabs now and the weight is about half of what it was before. And these things are heavy. These things are damn heavy. If you drop one of these on a ship, the ship notices, trust me, because <laughs> we've dropped a few on our ships. Very important, uh, these beams are, in keeping everything aligned. It's kind of tough to see from the track ship, uh, but we'll take another quick look at it anyway. It's got a groove underneath. And the whole purpose of that groove is to receive those blast door pieces as it's sliding back and forth and it helps to keep the ship straight no matter what's going on it we don't have to worry about whether or not the wheels are going to be staying on top of the ship the way that they're supposed to because the the beam inside the groove is going to keep us from having uh any kind of difficulty with things going off it's it's very easy to look at the ship only in terms of what it's going to do when it's under the power of thrusters, but we have to also consider how it's going to behave when it's got drills drilling underneath and bucking and bouncing all over the place. So that's why we have the beam to keep things separate. We've got all these wheels up top, and these are to help basically to um, align the beam and also to carry some of the load. So basically the, the ship for the most part is going to be riding on these wheels, they're very low friction, they're not set for propulsion, and definitely not set to do any steering. And the whole idea with these guys is that they're going to be, um, when we approach the track ship for the first time, they're going to be up like this. And then when we get lined up with the track ship and everything is together, then we lower the wheels, and as we lower the, the wheels, it raises the rest of the ship and pulls the beam into the groove. So this is something that we've done, we've tested before, it works really well, and I was very happy with it. The other problem that we had with the previous iteration that we got to test is that we had these bumper wheels um, that are basically, if you look at where the shocks are, where the suspension is relative to these, these ones are set up for a regular wheel suspension, they control the bouncing up and down. These ones are turned sideways so that they would ideally receive some of the impact. When we get to the end of the track, the wheels will give a little bit, they'll have a little bit of dampening, and then they'll have a little bit of strength that pushes things back. And what we found is that it wasn't really enough. It was really difficult to tune in a way that wouldn't cause the ship to basically break through the uh, blocks at the end of the track ship. And at that point, the whole thing is pretty much screwed. You either have to shut it down and repair it, reload, whatever it takes. You can't just let it keep going after that because the thing that stops the the gondola from going um, off the end of the track is gone. It's not there anymore. It's not going to stop it anymore. So that was something uh, that we had to address. And part of the reason why it took so long is I had to come up with a plan to address it. So what you'll see 
Uh, we might as well talk about these now. So we've got four thrusters on the front and four thrusters on the back. And these are designed specifically to be very visible. It's not difficult to see them and see which ones are thrusting and uh, in what direction, etc, etc. Because these are going to be the thrusters that control the forward and backward movement along the track. But more importantly, they're going to be fired opposite one another to control the speed of the gondola with just the thrusters. And it's going to be using some timer blocks and some crazy tuning and some setup and this is why we want to kind of save this for the next episode so for example say we want the the gondola ship to move uh forward down the track say it's starting on this end and we want it to move all the way down to that end without blasting through the barriers on that end that are supposed to stop it we would have these thrusters fire for say two seconds and then turn these thrusters off and then fire these ones for maybe a second or maybe fire all four of them at a reduced um, override or th there's a number of different things we can do. I'm going to try and stay away from the override, but the whole idea is that we want this to fire to slow the ship down, but not necessarily to stop it. And that's going to be the whole job of the timer blocks that are going to be inside this thing is to basically control how that's going to happen. And then when we reverse to go from the front of the track ship to the back, it's basically the same procedure, just reversing the order that we fire things in. Now, one of the reasons why we've got the four thrusters is also so if we don't want to mess around with the override, we could say, for example, fire four thrusters here to move it forward and then fire three thrusters on the front for the same duration so that it's not getting as much thrust. It might still be moving slowly a little bit when the thrusting is done that sounded um, a little bit vulgar, but that's okay. <laughs> so you get the idea. We're giving ourselves options to control it. And with the timer blocks alternating the thrust to keep the speed at a, a low kind of setting, it should hopefully alleviate the problem of blasting through the end of the block and kind of keep us at a good controlled speed. Additionally, we've got these sensors on the end of these beams, and they're definitely in harm's way. Uh, they are designed to detect when we're getting to the end of the track and we're gonna have to make adjustments to the track ship the design of the track ship so that there's something in the way that will trigger these sensors when you get to the end so that it can trigger the timer blocks that will change the configuration of the thrusters allow us a little bit of time for the connectors here to lock up with the connectors that are going to be on the ends of the track ships to transfer everything that we've mined out of the container on the gondola through the connector system the conveyor system to the atlas for storage so that we're not carrying around a lot of weight on the gondola it'll be whatever weight we have on the gondola it will be what we picked up in one pass going from full you know back to front or front to back on the track ship and then we pass it up to the atlas and then we start fresh with an empty cargo container so we're going to have timer blocks controlling all of that with the sensors triggering the timer blocks to say okay we're, we've reached the end go through the transfer system switch around the thrusters and then when we're ready we'll go so that's the thing. We've got these thrusters here and thrusters here and thrusters over there and thrusters over there that are just maneuvering thrusters because again, we don't need necessarily a ton of maneuverability on this thing, but we do need to be able to control where it's going so that we can line it up and land it on the track ship, close everything up and get it ready to go. So we've got these guys in place. I don't expect them to be doing a lot. Uh, you know, it's not gonna be a high performance ship by any stretch of the imagination. But then inside, we've got all of the guts. We've got a total of four gyros. We've got two over here and two over here. And these guys obviously exist for the purpose of allowing us to turn and pitch and yaw, all those things um, fairly quickly, fairly accurately, depending on what's going on. We've got a bunch of conveyors in here that are connecting the large cargo container at the very center right here. You can't necessarily tell that's a cargo container if you've never seen one before but that's what it is and we've got these uh, conveyors that are extending to conveyor blocks on the other side of the ship and these are where we'll attach the drills we'll have three rows of drills that all kind of start for example one row will start here and it'll have some that extend to the left and some that extend to the right and then we'll have another one that starts here extends to the left, extends to the right, and then another one all the way down here. This one got a little bit tricky because we're going underneath the bridge, so we wanted to make sure we were kind of sealing things up, but again, it'll start here and go left and right. 
that's how it looks now but I realized after the fact that we're gonna have to move these because if we have the front and the back rows of drills where they are now what's gonna happen is that they're gonna drill say up to this point and then it's gonna go back and then it's gonna go forward and it's gonna go a little deeper up to this point and then back and forward and then deep or, and eventually we're gonna to get to the point where it's trying to get the drills back to this point, but the landing gear is gonna be in the way. So what gives? Either we don't drill up to the previous point or we break off the landing gear. And if we break off the landing gear, the next thing to go is gonna be the window in front of the bridge. So we're gonna to have to move these conveyor blocks forward so that the drills are at least as far forward, if not one block farther forward than anything else on the ship. And that way we'll guarantee that we aren't going to be ramming the, the uh, front or the back of the ship into the walls that we're creating as we're digging down. I'm glad I thought of that when I did. Uh, I, I would have preferred to have thought of it even sooner, but we didn't. And that's kind of the thing. Uh, for lift thrusters, I originally had just these two large ion thrusters. You can see the cones sticking down between them, they weren't enough. And I'm not surprised. I mean, this ship weighs about half a million kilograms uh, and the ion thrusters have decreased effectiveness in atmosphere, especially dense atmosphere, like on the planet's surface. So these weren't quite good enough. So I added, uh, just for a little bit of assistance, a large atmospheric thruster. And this guy, in conjunction with these two, is barely enough to get this thing lifted off the ground and that's exactly what we want we don't want any more than that we want it to be able to lift and that's it so we're right where we need to be if we happen to be in a lower uh, atmospheric setting like on a moon or something like that where there's no atmosphere or a different planet where things are a little bit different these guys will have an increased capacity to do things and there will probably be a point especially on a moon where we could turn off the atmospheric thruster and just let the two ion thrusters do all the lifting and that, that will be perfectly fine by me. We've got, one of the things, this actually was surprisingly important to me when I was thinking about it, but we've got uh, our regular airlock sort of configuration access point with sensors. And you can see we've got an oxygen generator and we've actually got two oxygen tanks that we've been filling by setting the vent in the bridge to decompress and uh, basically it's sucking all of the oxygen out of the bridge which is immediately refilled because it's in an oxygenated atmosphere and that's how we filled those guys it was pretty handy I was happy with that but uh, it was important to me to have an oxygen generator and also an oxygenated bridge because if you're flying around in the ship you're trying to get things lined up you're trying to get things sorted out maybe you have to do some configuration changes or whatever you don't want to have to be worrying about whether or not your oxygen tanks have enough to keep you going so if we're in a um, no atmosphere environment a no oxygen environment we want to make sure that we've got something on board to make our life a little bit easier so we've got a vent up there that is providing oxygen or will be providing oxygen in a pressurized environment to the bridge so that we don't have to worry about that we can do the flying and do the, the configuring or whatever we need to do with this ship with a little bit of peace of mind that we've taken care of it so that i was glad that i thought of that um it might turn out to be a little bit superfluous once everything is tuned and running but it's not exactly an expensive thing to set up so we did it and it's done and and we're happy so that leaves us with our bridge with uh it took me a while to get the windows uh to something that i was happy with getting all the windows lined up so that they actually seal the room plus uh look not absolutely horrible a bit of a chore but it's done and now we've got the kind of the the front end of the ship is clearly indicated by the windows that allow you to see the seat uh the back end is just gonna be closed up with regular blocks uh you know we're gonna spend a little bit of time trying to make it look a little bit interesting but we're not gonna be spending a ton of time trying to detail it and make it look um anything crazy and that's the gondola so i mean like i say there's a lot going on there's a lot of different systems that are at play there's a lot of different things that it's going to be doing and trying to manage them all and make them all fit uh, has been the challenge with this ship because we want it to be the size that it is uh, without having to be uh, any heavier than it is and without making it so small at the outset that we can't fit everything that we need. So we've got room, we've got plenty of room now in the back end here to uh, mess around with. We can set up however many timer blocks we need. We'll move the conveyors so that the drills are going to be sitting on uh, the outer side of the landing gears instead of on the inside of the hull, relatively speaking. 
and then we will uh, work on revamping the track ship. What we'll probably end up doing is we'll set up a test uh, track ship up here in our, our previously constructed frame for doing exactly that thing. And then we'll get this thing set up and we'll get the track ship set up the way that we want it and we'll test it and if everything works then we'll duplicate whatever we had up here for the track ship somewhere else. We'll have a blueprint for that guy. We'll have a blueprint for this guy to make it easy. Uh, when the Atlas is moving around, you can actually strip these things down take off to wherever you need to be and then when you're landed you can just um, you know turn on the blueprints weld them all up and then be good to go for as much mining as you want to do before it's time to move on again so that's the plan we're, we're getting there we're, we're so close and I can't wait to mine some ice <laughs> so that we can fill up the hydrogen tanks on the Atlas and get it ready to take off and can we see it every time I there it is there's the Mars like planet that we're going to be heading off to and there's its moon that we're going to be visiting i'm kind of hoping that the moon is a little bit smoother on the surface than the moon for the earth-like planets so that we can actually get some mining action out of the atlas on the moon that would be neat but i'm not counting on it and then way off in the distance somewhere that i think the clouds are covering would be the uh the alien like planet that we're going to be getting at some point so we've got lots to do we're making very good progress now now that we've narrowed down some of the issues with our supply chain <laughs> In the next episode, like I say, we'll have something to show you that's moving and actually doing something interesting, aside from sitting here looking pretty. So if you want to be notified when I add that episode, the easiest way to do that is always to subscribe to my channel or follow me on social media. Links for social media are in the information box below the video. Feel free to leave your comments and feedback. Thanks for watching, guys, and take care.